Welcome everyone on behalf of the Theosophical Society headquarters in London, England, and from the Blavatsky Trust. Tonight, we are honored to have an extraordinary guest sharing on an incredibly inspiring topic, the legendary, glamorous, and somewhat mysterious Greta Garbo, the hidden theosophist. The one and only Moon Laramie is with us this evening and will be sharing on the spiritual awakening of the Swedish actress as she progressed from humble beginnings in a poverty-stricken district of Stockholm to a career as Hollywood's reluctant movie star. Following Garbo's mystical journey, Moon will highlight the occult themes in many of her films and the strength of feeling about theosophy in Hollywood at that time, the golden age. Moon's presentation is a jewel among jewels, as is he. And this talk is based on his book called The Spirit of Garbo. You should get your copy today. And Moon's other books include Theosophy and the Search for Happiness. And he is the editor of the Modern Theosophy series, uh, the works of Pablo Sender, Jenny Baker, and uh, Barbara, Dr. Barbara Herbert and Petra Meyer. And he has written articles for Watkins, The Best You, and Kindred Spirit magazines. His latest book, which I can't help but brag about, is called Blavatsky Unveiled. Now, this is a very, very big undertaking. This is uh, line by line, Isis Unveiled, translated from 19th century HPB writings into modern day English. This is an imperative work to get these teachings out into the modern world. So this is his latest book. This is Moon Laramie, again, uh, taking these writings. He's going all the way through Isis Unveiled 2. Uh, Secret Doctrine 1 and 2. So he has a very busy few years in front of him. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the one and only Moon Laramie. Thank you. You're so good to me, Anne. What a lovely introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to click share screen on here and I'm hoping it's going to all work wonderfully. There we are. I hope everyone can see that. Yeah. I can't see you, but Hopefully there are, everyone's waving at you. Yes, that they can yes. See it. that's Great. good. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do uh, during this talk is to first of all, give some biographical background and context to Garbo's early life, and also talk about what was happening in and around Hollywood at the time with regard to the growth of theosophy. Then we'll explore Garbo's particular spiritual journey and how she came to theosophy and how she came to the Western esoteric tradition. We'll also explode some of those popular myths and misconceptions about Garbo along the way. Oh, now, can I? It's not. Oh, right, I've worked out what I've got to do. Well done, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Greta Garbo was born Greta Louisa Gustafsson on the 18th of September, 1905 in a place called Sördermalm in Stockholm. Now, this was a very deprived area of the city and Garbo's family lived in extremely impoverished conditions. Her father, Carl Alfred Gustafsson, on the top left there, uh, was a manual laborer. And he worked in a succession of poorly paid jobs and he suffered from ill health all his life. His wages were barely enough to feed his three children, Greta, her older brother Sven, pictured at the bottom there, and her sister Alva Maria, pictured in the bottom right. Carl Alfred's wife was called Anna Lovisa Carlson, and it was she who held the family together and took on extra work to keep them afloat financially. Out of the three children, Greta was the youngest. They lived in a tiny two bedroom flat with no hot water. And also as was common in, in England at the time, they had an outside toilet. Now I lived in Sweden for a few years myself and Swedish winters are harsh, even at the best of times, even with uh, central heating and an indoor toilet. So the Gustafsons lived in very um, harsh conditions back, at, back in the day. So from a young age, Greta was fascinated with acting and she often spent time hanging around the stage doors of Stockholm theatres, although she didn't have the money to be able to afford to go in. Now, in 1922, she managed to secure a place at Stockholm's Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. And while she was there, she became one of the star students. 
and she managed to land roles in three films. Luffa Peter, Peter the Tramp in 1922, Jörste Berling's Saga in 1924, and Die Freud Lose Gasse, The Joyless Street in 1925. After she graduated from drama school, she changed her name to Greta Garbo and she left Sweden for Hollywood in 1926. And between 1926 and 1942, she made a total of 26 films for Louis B. Mayer's film studio, Metro Goldwyn Mayer. And she quickly became one of the biggest film stars on the planet. It's no exaggeration to say that Garbo mania in the 1920s and 1930s was the equivalent of Beatlemania in the 1960s. She could not go anywhere without being mobbed by press photographers and screaming hysterical fans. This was an aspect of her success as an actress that she shied away from and found really very difficult to cope with. This frenzied media attention really unnerved her in many ways. So remember that Greta Gustafsson, who was to become Greta Garbo, was born in 1905. And in 1906, something theosophical was stirring in the uh, hills around Hollywood. A dedicated theosophist called Albert Powell Warrington hit on the idea of developing a community of theosophists in the United States, a kind of theosophical colony and learning center. He presented the idea to Annie Besant and within a year, she became president of the Theosophical Society and she gave his project the green light. Over the next five years, he began constructing the buildings for his dream colony of theosophists in Beechwood Canyon, which was just north of Hollywood. Now at this time, Hollywood was not a major movie production center. It wasn't really until around about 1915 that the Hollywood Dream Factory began as film production companies migrated over from the East Coast. Warrington named the new theosophical community he was building Crotona, after the place where Pythagoras first founded his philosophical school. And Warrington would later go on to become the president of the Theosophical Society in America. So this new spiritual community began to be a magnet for wealthy and successful theosophists. There was Christine Stevenson, heir to the Pittsburgh Paint Company fortune, and the influential American choreographer, Ruth St. Dennis. There was also Frank L. Baum, who was the author of The Wizard of Oz, and even the movie world's leading clown and funny man, Charlie Chaplin. So these were some of the people who were among those who chose to settle in or near Cretona. So gradually, a theosophical community and a theosophical presence was starting to take shape and establish itself in and around what would soon become the center of the global movie industry. So for people around Hollywood, theosophy was very much in the air. Now this would carry on for decades. Even after Garbo stopped making movies in 1942, the influence of theosophy on Hollywood would remain very strong. Elvis Presley, for example, was a theosophist. He had a copy of The Secret Doctrine, which he referred to on a daily basis. He read the works of Alice Bailey, Manly P. Hall, Krishnamurti, and P. D. Aspensky. He was very widely read in occultism and, and esotericism. It's quite interesting, actually, because he was brought to theosophy by his friend and hairdresser, Larry Geller. And it was Larry Geller who really became Elvis's teacher and guide in all things esoteric. Another Hollywood leading light who took an interest in theosophy was Marilyn Monroe. She eventually converted to Judaism when she got married to Arthur Miller. But before that, she gave large donations to support the work of the Theosophical Society in New York. And in the 1970s and 80s and to the present day, Shirley MacLaine declared her interest in theosophy and reincarnation. 
she wrote several books on esoteric and occult concepts, one of which was made into a film called Dancing in the Light, which starred Charles Dance, appropriately named. Okay, so let's cut back to Garbo. While she was at stage school, she met the film director, Moritz Stiller, who's pictured there with her on the left. Now, Stiller was looking for somebody, an actress, who he could mold into a great actress, a great star with a special screen presence. Stiller used three words to sum up the qualities of the person that he felt would be the ideal movie star. This person had to have these three qualities. They had to be super sensual, spiritual, and mystic. In Garbo, he believed he found all of those qualities in abundance, but they were utterly raw. Now, even though Stiller died many years before her, their initial partnership and Stiller's mentoring of her would have a profound effect on the whole of Garbo's life and career. So in 1924, Stiller set up a meeting between himself and Garbo and the head and co-founder of MGM Studios, Louis B. Mayer. This meeting took place while Mayer was in Europe sorting out some production problems on Ben-Hur. Mayer had already seen Garbo performing in Jöster Berling's saga, which was also directed by Stiller. And he had been particularly struck by what he described as an ethereal quality, something mysterious in what lay behind Garbo's eyes. Mayer very quickly gave Garbo a contract and she and Stiller arrived in New York in June 1925 aboard the Swedish cruise ship Gripsholm. But on her arrival in America, she singularly failed to impress the critics. So when she arrived in New York as a hopeful newcomer, the newspaper columnist, Dorothy Woodridge, said of Garbo, her shoes were run down at the heels, her stockings were silk, but in one was a well-defined run. As a sartorial masterpiece, she was a total loss. MGM president, uh, Vice President Edward Bowes predicted that she would be heading back to Sweden in less than six months. And the MGM executive, Nicholas Schenk, couldn't even be bothered to see her. He said he was just far too busy. But just a few years later, the same Nicholas Schenk trembled and stuttered when he finally shook the hands of the woman who had now become the great movie star, Greta Garbo. So it was Stiller who helped mold Garbo into movie star material. He transformed her from the woman that Orson Welles once described as a great galumphing Swedish cow, and he changed her into an ethereal figure who seemed to glide effortlessly through the world, at least on screen. Stiller saw in Garbo something mystical, and he helped reshape her into someone very, very different. And if you compare these two pictures, the, and the, this picture here and the next one I'm gonna show you. Okay, so let's take a look at Garbo in action in a scene from one of her greatest films, Queen Christina. Queen Christina was a 17th century Swedish monarch who refused to marry the Spanish king and she abdicated to be with the Spanish consul, Don Antonio, who was the man she really loved. Garbo chose this role as Queen Christina because she was a powerful and interesting character who defied convention. And of course, also she was Swedish, uh, which of course fitted in marvelously with Garbo's Swedish accent. And during one scene, Garbo dresses as a man, and in another scene, she kisses one of her handmaids full on the lips. Now, this would have caused a sharp intake of breath among moviegoers in the 1930s, but Garbo liked to push boundaries, and she was definitely no hostage to convention. So in this, the final scene, Christina's lover, Don Antonio, played by Garbo's real life lover, John Gilbert, has been killed and Christina is sailing away to her exile with his body on board the ship. 
So this is about three and a half minutes and it's, it's one of the iconic scenes, um, one of the most iconic scenes in the Garbo film. And you'll see particularly uh, the way the, the, the camera closes on, on her at, at the end. So let's have a look and see Garbo in action. to say, Your Majesty? The house on the cliff. Yes, Arge. We will sail. Tell the captain. The tide is full and the wind is with us. The wind is with us. Okay, so that's um, Garbo in Queen Christina, one of the most iconic um, scenes from the film, and it's regarded as one of the most iconic um, end sequences in, in a Hollywood film of the time. How she manages to keep her eyes open without blinking and not have her eyes water um, during that, that time when the camera's really close on her, I'll never know. But anyway, so we've now got Garbo uh, in Hollywood in 1925 eager to hone her craft and become a serious actress. We've got a thriving theosophical community in the Hollywood Hills at Cretona, with notable figures such as Frank L. Baum and Charlie Chaplin drawn to theosophy. So theosophy is very much in the air among creative people and intellectuals connected to Hollywood. And how did Garbo come to know theosophy amongst all this? through this woman, Mercedes de Acosta. Now, Mercedes de Acosta was a Spanish-American poet and screenwriter, and she was born in New York in 1892. When she was a child, she became aware that she had extrasensory abilities. She took a deep interest in everything to do with the occult and hidden esoteric mysteries. By the age of 27, 
she had read the secret doctrine and she described it as an indispensable tool for true seekers of the truth. She soon took a deeper interest in theosophy and she developed a friendship with the notable theosophist, Eleanor S. Cooley, who founded several theosophical lodges in Cleveland, Ohio and New York City, which is no doubt where Acosta met her. Now, Eleanor Cooley was also a student of Jiddu Krishnamurti and Dea Costa later met Krishnamurti and she became a devotee of his. And she would often call on him for advice in her later years. And Krishnamurti lived for a long time in the Ojai Valley in California. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And in fact, Dea Costa would later go on to say of Krishnamurti that he represented the other side of California life, a more authentic side devoted to spiritual enlightenment through true metaphysical teachings. This was to her the real California, not the fake California oozing with materialism and obsession with glamour. This was very much the attitude that Garbo also had towards Hollywood. She wanted to act in great films, but the whole glamour culture and deification of film stars was something that she really couldn't get along with. She found it very, very uncomfortable to, to deal with. In fact, um, she never attended any of her own film premieres. She only ever went to one film premiere and walked down one red carpet, um, and that was for a, a John Gilbert film, and she did it because he was her boyfriend at the time and she was doing it as a favour for him. So um, walking down red carpets with people screaming at her and fainting in front of her was something that she, she thought was really a little bit strange, so she, she tended to avoid it. Okay, so how did Garbo and De Acosta meet? Well, Mercedes de Acosta first saw Greta Garbo when she went to see her in February 1926 in a movie at the cinema, a silent movie, Garbo's first American film, which was called Torrent. De Acosta was so mesmerized by Garbo's on-screen presence that she stayed in her seat at the end of the film and watched the whole thing a second time over. De Acosta said that she felt that behind Garbo's eyes, there was something mystical, something that she described as a look of eternity. It was at that moment, sat in a New York cinema, that Mercedes de Acosta decided that she had to meet Greta Garbo. Now, de Acosta eventually got to Hollywood in 1931. And in the June of that year, just a week before she was due to arrive in Hollywood, she spent some time on Long Island, with a group of friends who included the actress Tallulah Bankhead. Like De Acosta, Tallulah Bankhead was very interested in occultism and she regularly practiced divination through cartomancy. So one night Tallulah Bankhead got the old playing cards out and she asked uh, Mercedes De Acosta to draw some cards. She then asked her to make a wish and Mercedes crossed her fingers very hard, and of course, wished to meet Greta Garbo. Tallulah Bankhead then predicted that within three days of Dea Costa arriving in Hollywood, her wish would come true. And exactly as predicted on her third day in Los Angeles, Dea Costa was invited to the home of another screenwriter, Salka Fiertel. And the other person who happened to be there at Salka Fiertel's house at the time was of course, Greta Garbo. So as soon as they met, the two of them were immediately drawn to each other. In fact, as soon as Dea Costa shook Garbo's hand, she had an intense feeling that they had met before, not in their current incarnations, but in many previous incarnations. Now, this was very interesting because one of the things that Garbo had a strong belief in was reincarnation. This was one of the reasons she was drawn to theosophy. She said that once, once she was traveling uh, on the train to Berlin in 1924 with Moritz Stiller to attend a film premiere, she was overwhelmed by a powerful smell. When she got to Berlin, she realized that the smell was actually the smell of Berlin itself. And she was struck 
by the way that the city seemed very familiar to her. In fact, she knew where lots of things were, even though she had never been there before and she'd never read up on Berlin. She immediately realized that she had had all this familiarity with Berlin because she had lived in Berlin in a previous life. So Garbo and Mercedes de Acosta had this mutual fascination with occult ideas and they were drawn to each other and became friends and then they became lovers. Garbo was attracted to de Acosta because de Acosta was a feminist, she was a poet and she was a theosophist. Garbo um, was drawn to strong and cultured individuals and anyone connected to the occult always piqued her interest. As their relationship developed, Garbo and de Acosta would often go out together and spend time in nature. And one night, as the two of them sat together on a mountain peak in California's Casa del Mar, which I hope I'm saying correctly, as they sat on a mountain peak, uh, de Acosta initiated Garbo into the ideas of theosophy. They spent the whole night on the mountain sitting in silent contemplation and also talking about the secret doctrine, occult cosmology and reincarnation. So it was de Acosta who became Garbo's spiritual guide and Garbo was the willing pupil. But there were other guides and teachers throughout her life who influenced Garbo's ideas and influenced her worldview. In 1936, years after her mountaintop vigil with Mercedes de Acosta, Garbo met the composer Leopold Stokowski at a party which was given by the screenwriter and novelist Anita Luce. Now Anita Luce was the author of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, which later starred the other famous actress with an interest in theosophy, Marilyn Monroe. Anyway, Stokowski was a very committed occultist and he wrote uh, the music for numerous Hollywood films, most notably Disney's cartoon masterpiece Fantasia which he also appeared in. On meeting Garbo, just like Mercedes did, Stokowski sensed a strong psychic connection between the two of them. He told Garbo that they shared a destiny that had been written in the stars by the very gods themselves. <clears throat> now that's quite a chat up line. Mm -hmm. So Garbo was very much a spiritual seeker and her friendship with Stokowski involved exploring the knowledge that he gained from his time with ascetics and mystics while traveling in India. And one particular account which fascinated Garbo was of the time when Stokowski spent a whole day on a mountaintop discussing destiny and the soul with an Indian adept. After he and the adept parted company, Stokowski realized that during their conversation, they had understood each other perfectly even though he spoke not a word of Hindi and the sage spoke not a word of English. This struck a chord with Garbo because it reminded her of the time she spent on a mountaintop with Mercedes de Acosta, only then it was de Acosta who was the teacher and Garbo who was the initiate. So Garbo displayed many characteristics of what we might call a cosmocentric thinker, which is a, a term which is um, which was coined by the philosopher Ken Wilber. She always felt an intense connection to nature and to life itself. She had that strong sense that everybody and everything, every living thing were one. Her understanding and adherence to this important theosophical principle also led her to adopt vegetarianism. Garbo's sense of oneness with nature was so intense that it was remarked upon by people around her. The MGM film publicist, Hubert Voigt, who was also one of her lovers, uh, she had many lovers in her lifetime, both men and women. Hubert Voigt described her as a child of the sun shining with life. While Dea Costa described Garbo as a radiant goddess of the elements. Garb, uh, Mercedes described uh, Garbo as a radiant goddess of the elements. And she believed that Garbo had a hidden supernatural gift because of this. She believed that she had an ability to commune with and even to influence the elements. She recalled how they would often walk together in complete silence out in nature. And she said 
In all this time, there was not a second of disharmony between Greta and me and in nature around us. She said that the hours flew by and the two of them seemed to exist on a plane beyond time itself. That was how strongly she sensed Garbo's oneness with nature was. When out in nature, Garbo would walk around without any shoes on her feet because she said she wanted to feel the earth between her toes and that was the only way that she could do it. De Costa likened Garbo to a nature sprite formed from rocks, trees, storms and water jumping from rock to rock in her bare feet. Whenever there was a rainstorm in Los Angeles and other people would be running inside, Garbo would be running in the opposite direction. She'd be running outside and she'd literally dance around in a torrential downpour, getting absolutely soaked to the skin and loving it. What do you believe about God was a question that Garbo often asked people that she met. But this wasn't a test to see if somebody followed a particular faith. It was a genuine question based on a genuine desire to seek out and understand spiritual truths. To be honest, it was the comparative study of religion in many respects, another of Garbo's theosophical principles applied in her own life. Garbo saw every person as someone who she could learn from, someone she could learn spiritual truths from in, um, in terms of understanding their experiences with the divine. And Garbo was always open to a multiplicity of possibilities. Cecil Beaton, the world famous English photographer pictured with her there, described Garbo as an enigma brimming with spiritual thoughts. And Mercedes described her as a kind of wild mystic. Now Garbo believed that there was a great wisdom hidden in the Bible, but she found that she could not accept the church's literal interpretation. Her friendship with Mercedes de Acosta, de Acosta brought her into contact with a hidden world of occult beliefs and hermetic theology. Garbo came to realize that there was an esoteric meaning to the Bible that guided the reader away from crude ideas of hellfire and damnation. She believed that this hidden truth revealed a path of goodness which she described as the greatest force in the world. She felt there was a hidden truth known to students of the ancient wisdom, which revealed the secrets of the cosmos to the true seeker. She said that in her opinion, building churches was a waste of time. She felt that a sense of oneness with the divine was not to be found inside a building of bricks and mortar. Human beings were sparks of the divine and they had everything they needed within them to begin to sense that oneness. So we know that Garbo rejected the organized religion of the Christian church for a set of more heterodox spiritual beliefs founded around theosophy and occult teachings. She saw many devout conventional Christians as highly hypocritical. For example, one person who she felt was very hypocritical was the famous New York dress designer, Valentina. Now, Valentina made dresses for Garbo, Catherine Hepburn, Gloria Swanson, among other Hollywood luminaries. And Valentina, at one time, was a very close friend of Garbo's. But when Valentina's husband, the businessman George Schlee, developed a friendship which was quite platonic with Garbo, and he began to spend more and more time with her, Valentina developed a resentful jealousy and hatred, hatred of Garbo. When George Schlee died, Valentina barred Garbo from attending his funeral. She also arranged for a priest to exorcise every room in her own apartment where Garbo had been. And Garbo was shocked and hurt, extremely distressed by Valentina's actions. She said that she found it incredible that her former friend could pray and make the sign of the cross, yet at the same time behave so malicious, maliciously. So having rejected organized Christianity and other organized religion, Garbo found theosophy to be a spiritual tradition which captured her imagination and resonated with her much more. She was drawn to the concepts of astral travel, 
humanity's divine origins and evolutionary journey, reincarnation, and the rejection of materialism, all ideas to be found in the writings of H.P. Blavatsky. So with Garbo's non-conformist non tendencies, it was to the unorthodox figure of Blavatsky that she turned for spiritual inspiration. Garbo met Jiddu Krishnamurti, pictured in the top, top left there, when she and her friend, the screenwriter Salka Fiertel, attended an autumn picnic party at Aldous Huxley's home in Tuyunga Canyon in 1939. I hope I pronounced that correctly. The philosopher Bertrand Russell and the author Christopher Isherwood were part of a guest list crammed with intellectuals and the glitterati of California. For a long time, Garbo had been eager to meet Krishnamurti. The reason being that she wanted to learn all she could from the former theosophical world teacher and leader of the Order of the Star in the East. And in her typical modest way, paying no attention to fashion or etiquette, Garbo arrived for her meeting with Krishnamurti dressed in her usual straw gardening hat and a pair of old trousers. So Garbo's interest in the occult led her to adopt a rigidly simple lifestyle. When not working, she followed a routine of rising every day at 6 a.m. to do yoga and breathing exercises. Well into her 60s, she practiced calisthenics and standing on her head on the terrace of her apartment in Klosters in Switzerland. She ate a diet of healthy, natural foods, and she was strongly inspired by, and a very close friend of, the healthy eating guru, Gaylord Hauser. In fact, one story goes that one day, during the making of the film Marie Velishka, the sound technician detected unusual noise interference on set, and try as he might, he couldn't make out what the strange noise was. When he and the director, Clarence Brown, investigated, they discovered it was coming from Garbo's dressing room. When they went in, they found her pureeing vegetables in a blender for her lunch. Now, the novelist Sinclair Lewis said of Garbo that of all the Hollywood actors he had known, she was the one who had never been taken in by it all. In his words, she had never gone Hollywood. But despite her tendency towards a simple life, there was one pleasure that Garbo could never deny herself. In 1939, Mercedes de Acosta read an article where Gandhi wrote that nicotine thickened the spiritual body and hampered its development. De Acosta immediately gave up smoking. Garbo never did. Now, the idea of reincarnation is a central principle in theosophical thought. Theosophy describes a wheel of rebirths. Each living being is the product of many previous lives, all lived and learned from over millennia. Each new incarnation is strongly influenced by the previous ones. And from a young age, even before discovering theosophy, Garbo subscribed to this belief in reincarnation. Even as a young girl, Garbo thought that the soul did not die but went on a journey after it left the body. When her father died in June 1920, and she would have been about 15, she said that she felt certain that he still existed in some form of after-death state. In her mind, he had simply gone somewhere else, to another place where she was unable to see or to find him. She was very certain that this was not heaven or hell but simply another plane of existence. Garbo discussed reincarnation with her friend, the art collector, Sam Green, who believed firmly in this principle. Green was fascinated with the subject and he studied its history in different religious and spiritual systems. During their time together, Garbo explored these ideas with him. They both read Far Memory, the autobiography of the English novelist Joan Grant, which described her many incarnations. They debated the extent to which each incarnation might provide lessons to be learned for the one that followed. Garbo also joked that she would like to be born in China in her next incarnation, as she thought that Chinese people always had the most perfect skin and never got wrinkles. She also 
talk to Sam Green about how there might be other worlds and other levels of existence beyond the material plane. In Garbo's view, the human mind with its limited capacities could never truly grasp the immensity of eternity and the absolute. The incomprehensible nature of the absolute was a recurring source of fascination for Garbo. She saw human beings as small earthbound creatures lacking the ability to understand the true nature of eternity. The question is simply too big for us. Interestingly, in Queen Christina, Don Antonio, played by John Gilbert, tells Garbo's Christina that he senses there is a great mystery within her. She replies revealingly, is there not a great mystery in every human being? Garbo and Mercedes de Acosta were interested in astral travel, a latent human power, according to the theosophical tradition. Mercedes researched into the ability of adepts in the Far East to travel astrally. She wanted to understand how they were able to consciously direct a projection of themselves onto the astral plane. She subscribed to the theosophical belief that the soul traveled on the astral plane both during sleep and after death. De Acosta experimented with astral travel and Garbo worked with her on this. When she and Garbo were thousands of miles apart, De Acosta astrally projected herself from her own home in Brentwood to Garbo's hotel room in Stockholm. On her astral visit, she made a mental note of the room's colours, furnishings and decoration. When she later checked these details with Garbo, they matched the physical reality of the room perfectly. De Acosta and Garbo both believed that she had been able to travel to Garbo astrally because there was a powerful psychic force connecting the two of them. Garbo very strongly believed in powerful astral connections between people who had a strong emotional bond. Garbo confided to her friend, the Swedish Countess Herke Wattmeister, that by concentrating her own thoughts, Garbo was able to slip into Herke's mind and read her thoughts anytime she liked. And the concept of astral travel actually appears in one of Garbo's films, Anna Karenina, a film that she made twice, one silent version and then a sound uh, version with the arrival of the talkies. So in the film, uh, Garbo plays Anna Karenina and when Anna's affair comes to light, it's discovered by her husband, Count Vronsky, who's played by Basil Rathbone, the scandalized and cuckolded Vronsky banishes her from the family home. He tells their young son, Sergei, that his mother is dead. Sergei, however, refuses to believe this, and he suggests that his mother will travel to him across the astral plane. He says, if I go to sleep, I know that mother will come and kiss me goodnight. In fact, Garbo's otherworldly interests were depicted in a number of her films. Now, Garbo was very, very clever. She was very canny because when her contract with MGM was up for renewal, she renegotiated the contract in terms of having more control over the films that she made and the roles that she chose. And she even had some control over the leading men and other leading characters, actors that, that play characters in her films. So she was able to select certain films that had certain esoteric themes hidden within them. In Marta Hari, uh, the film begins with Garbo performing the mystical and sacred Javanese temple dance. Now here she is on the top left uh, in the opening scenes of Marta Hari. In Camille, which is the bottom left there, she tells her lover, Armand's father, that she has had a premonition of her own death. In Anna Christie, bottom right, she hints at after death states and reincarnation. She describes being lost in a fog for what seems like forever, ultimately emerging with no memory of anything that happened before. And in The Painted Veil, which is top right, uh, Garbo's character, Catherine, develops a deep attachment for her adopted home of China. Not long after arriving, 
She describes it as a country so full of spells, they seem to be the reason for everything. Later on, she witnesses a dance performed at a Chinese sun and moon festival. Dancers in ornate costumes act out a legend in which the sun god slays a dragon to save his lover so they can roam across the skies for all eternity. Next, she has her fortune told in a Buddhist temple filled with burning incense and the temple is said to be occupied by ancient and mighty gods. So, to finish, don't believe all you are told about Greta Garbo, the sad and lonely figure who is only ever famous for the phrase, I want to be alone. She never actually said that. What she actually said was, I want to be left alone. And she meant that she wanted to, be, to, to stop being hounded by the press and photographers and the public. In her view, she was just a jobbing actress. That was all she wanted to do. She wanted to play interesting roles in theatre or in film. All of the other paraphernalia that went with it, she wasn't comfortable with. In fact, a lot of the hysteria frightened her, frightened her a great deal. She had no interest in being a centrefold in magazines or walking down red carpets while people screamed and fainted before her, which happened when she went out in public, even though she didn't go down the, the, the red carpet. There's a story when she visited Sweden and numerous people fainted uh, at the quayside when, when she, she came off the boat. In fact, um, as I said before, she only went to, to one Hollywood premiere and it wasn't even her own, one of her own films. She thought that all of the Hollywood glamour machine was nonsense and crowds of screaming people terrified her. But she did have a small and close circle of friends. Among them, Aristotle Onassis, Sam Green, Cecil Beaton, and even Princess Margaret. And she had a very happy and very private social life. So ultimately, Greta Garbo was not the tragic, lonely figure we have been so often led to believe. She was a woman who defied convention and had a strong interest in profound spiritual questions, but she rejected orthodox answers to those questions. And along with occultists such as Mercedes de Acosta, Sam Green and Leopold Stokowski, she explored questions of reincarnation, astral travel, laws of karma and oneness with the absolute. Mercedes de Acosta once said that most artists could never become spiritually developed because it meant letting go of their egos and becoming detached. Perhaps in Greta Garbo, she finally found the one who could. <laughs>